Elisa Capelli from TU Delft, and she'll give a talk on novel metal behavior and extraction in molten salt reactor. So I'm very happy to be here today, and I will present you some uh, interesting results, I hope, on the novel metal behavior and on the extraction of this kind of fission products in molten salt uh, reactor. When I found out that my talk was in the reactor physics session, I was a bit surprised because usually I'm like the I'm more on the chemistry side, and, but I found this very interesting because it's a kind of peculiarity of the molten salt reactor, that you have this uh, promising sy synergy between the reactor physics and the chemistry. Molten salt reactor is very well suited with the thorium fuel cycle. It has this peculiarity of a liquid fuel, and this liquid fuel offers some advantages. And one of the advantages that it offers is the possibility of extracting and conditioning some of the fission products. If you want to use these techniques, you need to know a bit more on the chemistry and on the physical process behind the extraction. Here you can see the fission product classification. So we have three big classes. The first one is the noble gases. This is the main contributor like xenon and krypton. These gases are uh, neutron poison, so the idea is that we need to remove this gas as quick as possible to, to keep the good breeding ratio. The second class, the majority of fission products are salt soluble, so they stay in the salt for the, and so they form stable fluorides that are not released during reactor operation. And the third class, it's about the noble metals. The noble metals are the purple one. Usually used in uh, solid fuels, you have these five metal particles. In our case, we also have niobium, which is something in between the soluble and the noble metals. So I'm going to talk today about the noble metal fission products. And what I, the answer or that I hope to give is to the question, what is the fate of this element? And this depends mainly on three, uh, on three parameters. The first is the chemical speciation. And that depends, of course, on temperature and redox potential. But the effect that can have is very striking because the noble metals can be solid, liquid, or gas. So of course it's very different what you get. The second is about the reprocessing strategy. As I mentioned in, uh, in the molten salt reactor, this case I think it's the molten salt fast reactor, the salt soluble are not reprocessed online, so they are extracted by batch, while the, the noble gas are extracted online via, with the helium bubbling. And what it was found out is that uh, in some cases, you can have these noble metals particles that are attached to the bubble, and they are extracted via flotation. So what becomes really important is what is the efficiency of this process. So we want to understand what is the physics behind that in order to be able to optimize the adjustable process parameter to maximize the extraction of noble metals. So the research activity we are doing at Delft, also in collaboration with Energy, are mainly three on three lines. We have a development of a thermodynamic database that includes all the chemical form of the poss uh, possible chemical form of noble metals in order to be able to predict what will be the chemical speciation. Then we investigate the physical chemical properties of the noble metals in fluoride salts, for example, the size of these precipitates. And finally, we want to study the, the process, so the extraction via flotation, and to develop this, uh, this process. So the first uh, chapter, let's say, of my presentation is about the chemical speciation. I will go quite fast on this. And in order to be able to predict what is the chemical stable form of fluorides, we need to develop a thermodynamic database. And the way it is done, so we, what we want to put in the database is all the possible chemical form that you can have between the noble, metal the noble metals, so molybdenum, ruthenium, palladium, and so on, with the fluorine. Of course, then on a, ne sec on a next step, we also need to take into account the intermetallic phases formed between the noble metals, and then we'll have a, a database that comprises all the possible phases. And the way this is done is by combining three methods, the density, density functional theory, statistical mechanical calculation, and finally, uh, the thermodynamic modeling. So the first two methods 
are used to describe the thermodynamic properties of all the gaseous species that you can form. And they are a lot. So they are, um, for all the noble metals, you can have the gaseous species starting from the monofluorides up to the, so in case of molybdenum, up to the hexafluoride, and then you have also some dimer and trimer species. All that goes into the database. And then also some condensed phase are added. For example, in case of molybdenum, again, you have the trifluoride and the tetrafluoride and the pentafluoride that are also stable as a liquid or solid. And that provides a description of the system. One important result that we can calculate is uh, what is the noble metal speciation in MSR. And that's described by this uh, graph, which is a, called a, it's an Ellingham diagram. So on this scale, you have the fluorine potential, so the amount of free fluorine that you have in your reactor. And on the other scale, you have the, the temperature. So these are the two important parameters. And if, for example, if we take the molybdenum, so you just have to look at the red lines. So below the bottom line, in this condition, molybdenum is stable as metal. So you have molybdenum precipitate. Then if you increase, you form some molybdenum trifluoride that goes into solution. And then if you go again above with the fluorine, you form all the, a mixture of gases. What is interesting is that during the reactor operation, the redox potential will increase. So we will start from this window, the blue one. That's usually the, the, the condition that are kept by the redox, uh, by the redox buffer. So between a uh, ratio between UF4 and UF3 keeps the reactors in this, re this uh, region for the redox potential. But during the fission, when the fission occurs, you go from an oxidation state average of plus four to plus three. So we are increasing the, our uh, redox potential. So in if the redox potential control fails, then we are moving up into this diagram. So the first noble method that will appear is niobium. And that was also observed during uh, MSRE operation. And then you go up and you start to see molybdenum and ruthenium. So these are really not likely to see these species, but still it's important because if we assume now that we are able to extract these noble metals and we want to separate them, you need to have an idea on at which fluorine potential they will come out to be able to separate them. So the idea, what we found out is that under nominal redox condition, all the noble metals are stable as metallic precipitate. They are very hydrophobic, so they are unwet by the salt. And they tend to migrate to surface, like the helium bubbles. And, and then they are extracted with it. So then the idea is that we need to, to optimize this process, the helium bubbles. And the way that we are doing that is in different steps. The first step is to use simulant fuel, simulant fluids, and simulant particles. The reason is uh, quite clear because of course, working with molten salt at high temperature, they are corrosive. So you need to use some, uh, for example, astelloy N or some alloys. And it's not then possible to have a look at what's happening during the extraction. So the first step is to use this simulant fluid, fluid, and then we can move up to real molten salt and dynamic condition. So the requirements need for the fluid are simple. We want that it's uh, a liquid at room temperature. We want a non-corrosive fluid and transparent so that we can have a really a look at the mechanism during the extraction. And of course, it needs to also to keep some similarities on for the hydrodynamic condition of the system at, at high temperature. So that's a list of some of real uh, molten salt. So we have flynac, lithium, thorium, and also with some beryllium ad addition. And behind you can find, below you can find some uh, model fluids, so a mixture of water and glycerol, ethanol and water and water. So there are many parameters involved and, ca and can be somehow difficult to describe the complete system. So the idea was to focus on one important parameter for the flotation, so the probability of collision between a particle and a bubble. And this depends on particle size this is also on the bubble size, but depends also on the hydrodynamic condition. So you can simplify it, it depends on Reynolds, and Reynolds depends on the kinematic viscosity. 
So what we decide is to go and uh, look for a fluid that has a similar kinematic viscosity at room temperature as the salt at high temperature. And that's a mixture of glycerol and water that, as you can see, it's very similar to the lithium beryllium thorium mixture. And by changing the concentration of glycerol in water, we can change uh, the kinematic viscosity so we can adapt to the real molten salt. That's the experimental setup that we are using. That's uh, there's the simple version with a static column. The gas the, is added from the bottom where there is a bubble distributor that produces bubbles. And the liquid plus the particles, so we use a mixture of the water and glycerol, we add some uh, molybdenum particle, for example, or some noble metal particles. And so we have an initial concentration that is fixed. It's injected from the top. And then the experiment is starts. So you have bubbles that will encounter the particles on, during in the column. And then the, they will form an aggregate. This aggregate will be dragged to the top, to the interface. And then noble metals will be collected on this curved part of what is, this is called an element tube. So we run the experiment for some time, and then we evaluate what is the extraction efficiency as function of the particle size, of as function of particle density, and bubble size, so, and the gas flow rate at the, at the bottom. The first important thing is to characterize the gas dispersion, because then if you want to scale it or go to a more complex system, what is the real important Parameters are the superficial gas velocity, so the amount of gas divided by the area, the bubble size distribution, so how, and the bubble, size distribu the bubble size that we decide to have, it's very similar to what was designed for the molten salt uh, breeder reactor. And the third parameter is the gas holdup. So this, the bubble size and the gas holdup goes together and form what is called the bubble uh, surface. And that's an, a key parameter if you want to scale up the, your system. And uh, then another important parameter is the bubble velocity. So we need a transparent fluid because we want to look at the mechanism of particle and bubble attachments. And this is very different if you change the particle size. And what we saw is that the combining the the visual observation with the quantitative results, it's, it's very important because it can give you some hints on how this process goes. It's an example of the results for molybdenum. We performed some studies on the extraction efficiency, ex function of the particle size, particle density, and volume gas flow rate. So that's just uh, an example you have on the, on the left. You have uh, extraction efficiency as a function of the gas flow rate. As you can see, there is not much change as you increase the gas flow rate, except for the last part, where there is a different mechanism that starts to play a role. In, in the, let's say, with a really high gas flow rate, what happens is that the bubble flow is so strong that particles are dragged and are extracted even without forming an aggregate. So in the relevant range is uh, below this uh, threshold of the gas flow rate. And in the other graph, you can see the extraction efficiency as, as function of the particle size. And there are three ranges. So if the particles are, are very big, then they, they are heavy. So once they form the aggregate, they tend to either detach or the, the let's say, the the, the bubbles are not strong enough to lift the particles and drag them out of the fluid. Then you have a region, and this region goes between, between one micron and 100 micron, where the floatability and the extraction is, uh, is quite good. It's around uh, 40% or 50%. And then for low particle size, then the extraction efficiency decreases again. And in this case, what's happened is that the probability of collisions is decreasing because particles are very small and, they, and the flow that is created around the bubble is kind of disturb their motion. So to try to understand this process, we start to work on a computational model to describe this, uh, this process. 
And for the, this model consider four phases, the fluid, the bubbles, or, and the free particles, and the last, uh, the last element is the particle and bubble aggregates. So what we want to describe is the transport, or let's say the transfer rate between the free particles and the particle aggregate. And that's uh, combining what is the CFD model with an Eulerian approach. So we will look at the volume and not at the single bubble. <coughs> and, we this, and then this uh, combined with the flotation theory to try to describe this, the, the transfer rate between free particle and, bub and capture particle. And this depends the, on the flotation theory. It's a, we use a deterministic approach. So we try to evaluate what is the probability of collision, probability of adhesion, and then the probability that this aggregate is stable enough to reach the extraction, extraction zone. So what is uh, the probability of collision can be quite good, good described by the CFD model. What is key in flotation is the description of the probability of adhesion. And this can be all summed up in one term, which is called the induction time. And this induction time is usually very difficult to measure, or almost impossible to measure. So what the idea is that we can couple the CFD model with the experimental data, trying to extrapolate this induction time. And once we found this extraction time, we can find a relation as function of the particle size and bubble size. And this calibration can then also be used for the, to the application for more complex scenario, for example, as with real molten salt or with a dynamic system. So there are also some uh, further experimental work that are either ongoing or planned that consider the dynamic condition and consider actual molten salt to compare these results with a more realistic situation. So uh, I just want to conclude and uh, what I hope I showed you in a very, in, in a summary, let's say, is that uh, what is, it's the thermic chemical data are key input parameter for the process design. So we need to know what is the chemical, uh, the chemical speciation. We need to know, for example, what is the particle size of these aggregates, and that's another uh, study that is ongoing. And we need to know this as they are input to define the fission products management strategies. Then we use some simulant fluid and particle to, to perform a reconnaissance study on noble metal extraction and to confirm the feasibility of this separation in a static column. The next step is, that, uh, is to develop a molten salt system that will, that will uh, measure the real extraction efficiency with uh, real particles and real fuel. And this can be uh, then extrapolated to more complex system when we have a, a working CFD uh, flotation simulation uh, platform. So that's the end of my presentation. And I would really be happy to answer your question. Okay, uh, in your bubble you have your gas, your helium, but you have also the partial pressure of the salt, which is not negligible at 700 degrees Celsius. Do you take into account this partial pressure? Not with this system because, yeah, of course it's, uh, it's watery and glycerol, so it's very difficult to, to take this into account. But of course when we are now in the stage of designing a system with the molten salt, and that will be, of course, very important to also take into account the partial pressure of fluorine and the redox conditions. Because during the process, you modify the composition of the yeah. salt. Yeah. yeah, so it's, of course, the, the real scenario is more difficult than what we have here. So the idea is that if we understand the basics, then we can move one step forward <laughs> to the understanding. Some molten salt reactor designs have an active bubbling system, yes. you know, actually injecting bubbles. Yeah. Um, 
uh, and some only have the bubbles being produced as uh, fission product gases. So what is the difference between those two approaches? Because the, the active bubbling introduces some complexity into the design. Yeah, so what we are considering is this uh, second part. So you have the xenon and krypton that are produced and to extract them you want to introduce helium bubbles. Of course this introduces some complexity into the system. For example, to also to determine what is the bubble size that you want, you need to take into consideration the fact that you are introducing some void coefficients, some turbulence. And then also, what, so what I'm considering as my starting point is the, similar to the design of the MSPR. So you have a 10% bypass of the reactor. And this 10% of the fuel salt will be processed. So you will introduce the bubbles and extract the bubbles. And so that's only a very limited amount of bubbles actually circulates into the reactor. How would other gases such as argon and nitrogen compare with fuel? The difference is the solubility of the gases into the fuel salt. So I think there are also some, uh, some design that considers argon as well. But uh, so I f what I only found in literature is the comparison between argon and helium. And it looks like the helium, it's a bit better than argon com for the solubility into the molten salt fluorides. <coughs> so, in your model, have you, where, where do you think the impacts of, uh, of the surface properties of the particles may be? So, wettability or zeta potential, where would that fit into your model? For the flotation? So, these parameters are what determines the probability of addition. So, you have these three steps, and you have the bubbles and particles coming together very close, and that's probability of collision. But once the bubble and particles are very close to each other, what the, the mechanism that has to, well, what has to, be, to happen is that you rupture the thin film between the particle and the bubbles, and that's exactly where the hydrophobicity or the Z potential between these two lines comes in and play a role. So in this model, they are all together in the induction time. In the MSRE, when they did uh, <coughs> the they kind of lost control of the redox, so they got to be very high redox. And that's when they got the foam and they got a lot of stuff extracted. It seems to be the opposite of what your charts are showing. Mm -hmm. That when you get the high redox, your charts are saying the metals become liquids or gases, and their experience was... <laughs> I, if I'm not mistaken, in this case, with the uranium-233, they saw niobium in solution. So what time, if I go back to the, so if I just, so I think in this situation, they had an increase in the redox potential, so they saw niobium in solution. That was the niobium F3 going into solution. But so the redox potential was not that high to also have molybdenum and all the other matter into solution. and. So what they saw is, uh, as you were saying, they saw a lot of extraction because they, have, uh, they had this open pump where they were creating foam, so they were extracting a lot of noble metals. But I think the redox potential was not high enough to... to yeah, exactly, to go into the gas phase. All right, cool. We move along. Let me thank the speaker again.